So hopefully at this point it becomes easier to understand that integrated hypocrisy is in large measure due to integrated inability to conceive of the reality of God despite the fact that if you wanted to, God would just make you understand. It's not instantaneous, but it does occur and can occur. Obviously not from your own power, but definitely according to your own volition. You want it, he gives it to you, period. Now, if what you want is this world, then you get that too. But since that's not his will for your life, then you're free to make your own way in this world. Now, there are a whole lot of people who really want to do that. And just as in his world, it's a matter of how much you want it. So in this world, it's the same thing. And there are a whole lot of people. Percentage-wise, it's small, but in numbers, it's large. You know, maybe 1%. Who, they're very competent. They work really hard at integrating with this world. They really buy into it. Or even if they don't, they buy into getting ahead or getting whatever it is they want. And that takes a lot of work. Anything you want out of this life, you really got to work for it. Now, a lot of people say, well, but I really didn't. I didn't do anything. I inherited it or it just came to me. Honey, once you get it, you're either working for it to get it or you're working for it because you got it. The cost is really high. I think one of the worst things that can happen to anybody is to be rich. The lifestyle you have to live is so horrible. Poverty looks a lot better. You got your freedom when you're poor. You say, well, no, I don't. I have to work all the time. And then I'm only home for a couple of hours. Yeah, but honey, you're your own person 24-7. Nobody cares about you. And you say, well, that's a bad thing. No, it's not. When you're the cynosure of all eyes, you don't have a life. I don't care what you own. I don't care how pretty you are. I don't care how whatever it is you are. You're walking around in a fishbowl. There ain't nothing in this world worth that cost. And of course, the people who manage to achieve something in life one of the main things they do with the money that they get is they try to buy themselves privacy and separation. And it comes at a really high cost. So you end up being jaded one way or the other. Jaded because things don't work out the way you want them to. Or jaded because they did. That's integration with this world. I've covered it before, and I'm just sort of like summarizing what I've said before in a new context. The context of integrated hypocrisy, because the joke's on you. You work so hard to get all this, and in order to really get anywhere in this life, you do have to be hypocritical. Okay, you made it. Joke's on you. The hypocrisy of having worked so hard to achieve something. And what did you achieve? A little bit of peace, maybe. Maybe you got that dream A-frame house that's overlooking the lake in the forest. Yeah, and how much expense and how many times do you have to go do something else in order to maintain it? And hello, you can't keep it clean by yourself. So that means you got to hire people to poke around in your stuff. And you know they're going to talk. 
because you're famous. You're well known. You're rich. You got this. You got that. Pick a little talk, little pick, little talk, little cheap, cheap, cheap. From Bye Bye Birdie. I mean, and the weirdest part about all this, the part I hate the most, is that that's what people like to do. The hoi poi. I, I learned this when I was a kid, and it always just really drove me crazy. The hoi polloi, especially when I was growing up in 1950s America, you know, women were expected to be, uh, to sort of play a certain role. And to a large measure, the role that women were expected to play, they actually wanted to play. Pick a little talk, little, pick a little talk, little, cheep, cheep, cheep. Well, Mary Jane did this, and Johnna Jones did that, and look at the stockings, and oh, she's wearing a red dress. And so, you know, when they had the whole Hollywood thing that really came into prominence in the 1940s and 50s, and they made good movies then, well, stilted acting, but good movies. I mean, you know, everybody and you know, because I grew up in L.A., and that's all, it's all about acting. So this was kind of like, you know, everybody and his brother, you either dated an actor, or you knew an actor, or you're trying to be an actor. Um, everybody was like, oh, well, let's go look at, you know, the, the, the daily news about what so-and-so actress or actor is wearing or dating or blah de blah of course, now it's worldwide, that kind of preoccupation. In those days, it was just pretty much restricted to Hollywood. Being all involved in whether Jane Doe actress had lunch at Chasen's with some other young actor. And were they sleeping together? What do you you don't have better things to do with your time and your mind than speculate about that? And frankly, the answer is no. This is the thing about people that really gets to me. People are busy looking at other people. And raising all kinds of stuff. Focusing on details about the lives of other people. That's how they live. It's a phenomenon that's been known throughout history. They call it vicarious living. And it's a great way that politicians have learned long ago. And playwrights especially. This is how you keep people occupied. This is how you keep them entertained. This is the stories about the prince and the princess lived happily ever after. That's all in this genre. Okay? You spend your little life, which doesn't have any meaning because you sweep floors, looking at Cosmo or whatever, the Daily Tattler, with gossip about somebody you never met and never will, about what you hallucinate that they wore or did. Look at all the hoo-ha over Princess Diana. Everything she wore and the way her hair looked in la di la People just really eat that up because for them, it's their way of being somebody else. That's the height of their, what do you want to call it, thought process. Back in 1950s America, everybody wanted to imitate whatever was happening on television or in the film. If somebody, some actress wore a certain kind of dress... Well, then everybody have to go out and buy that dress. And, you know, the people who wrote the films and the people who made the costume knew that. They would get, you know, cheaper prices on the costumes. Because they go to a, deck, you know, they go to an interior designer or they go to a, you know, a couturier and say, Hey, you know, if you design the clothes for our set, everybody's going to want to buy your clothes. Okay. So the whole industries respond just because, you know, Marilyn Monroe wore some kind of dress in a movie. 
It's still going on, except it's worse now. This is the way people's minds want to go. Okay, well, guess what? If that's the way people's minds want to go, that's the pathway that their minds want to walk on horizontally. So that's why there have to be kings in heaven. I hate this. I hate this so much. I, I, the other day I was watching some movie, I forget what it was, and God reminds me of this thing. While I'm watching it, because I, I, it was Little Lord Fauntleroy. Yeah, that was it. A classic movie with Freddie Bartholomew. And how all the people were so interested in the little boy's life and whether or not he was really going to be the rightful Earl because there was some other fake claimant to the title. And I'm sitting there and he hits me while I'm watching it. And I'm thinking, this, this is the way their minds are occupied? They're all rooting for the little boy. And very proud of themselves for doing so. And very happy doing so. That's the extent of their mental... What do you want to call it? Foray. They don't understand truth. They don't understand principle. They don't care about the big picture. They want something right in front of their face of somebody who they can say is ours. Our Earl. Our little Lord Fauntleroy. And that makes them happy. There's no way that a mindset like that is going to comprehend God. It's not even going to think to ask a question. The word God is said, oh yeah, you know, go to church on Sunday, wear your nice clothes, nod, and, you know, observe all the holidays. You know, the the, the vicar put some slot slotted wood thing at the head of the, I don't know, entrance to the church telling you that it's going to become Whit Sunday. Oh, it's going to be Whit Sunday. Well, I'll wear my black hat then. That's their idea of, you know, holy observance. It has nothing to do with God. They can't even possibly conceive of it in any other way. Because everything's rooted horizontally in the local, in the parochial, in the I, me, my. My father, my sister, my father, my brother, my friend. There's, there's, no, there's no cogitation about principle. And when anybody starts to talk about principle, and the biggest, easiest way to see that is when anybody starts to talk about math. Oh, the eyes just glaze over. Oh, the Bible in the beginning, God created the heavens in the air. You didn't get to sleep too much the night before, so oh, now you can go to church and sleep. Nobody understands that stuff. Because they don't want to. It's too remote. So that's the soul that gets built. And they want to be integrated with the world down here. And frankly, just as much as you know, they're not interested in God, they're not really interested in getting too far ahead in this life either. They're just not too much of anything. A little bit of this, a little tea and baguette, and they're good. God bless them. That's the soul that dies. That's the soul that probably did believe in Christ at some moment during life because the vicar said so and they believed it. Doesn't matter if they didn't investigate the question. They liked the vicar. He said it was true, so they believed it. Happens to be true. So they happened to me in heaven. Just as dumb. Because truth should be free to be what it is. And you should be free to go where you want to in your mind. And if you want to focus all of your attention on Sally Jo's bow, on her dress that's a little bit racy, 
then that kind of petty thinking is going to be the way your soul works when you're dead. And of course, once you're dead, that same petty soul can say, Oh, Jesus Christ is nice. Yeah. And he really is. It won't be a lie. But it's still a petty way to appreciate him. And you'll be happy being petty. Is that what you want? This is the world of the future. Today. The parochial nature of the human race is I, me, my, my father, my sister, my brother, my mother. Truth? Ha <laughs> ha. Processing thought for itself? Oh no. Eyes glaze over. So, I mean, it is integrated hypocrisy. But we don't even know that it's hypocrisy because we're incompetent. And, and we don't even, we, we can't process. What it is. Enough even to ask the question of the ceiling. Because, I mean, I can't process it any better than anybody else. But I ask questions. And he creates the vertical axons and dendrites through scripture learning and living on Bible precept on precept. But you know what your typical human being precept was that? John Doe says Jesus Christ paid for my sins, I believe it. That's as much as they know. The idea of independent thought or evaluating truth for its own sake, no, mm -mm. And so all those people, well, not all of them, but a good many of them, who achieved something in this life and worked really hard to do it, to the extent that they even decide, you know what, I really want to just get away from this parochial human race. Even them. Where do they go with their attempt? at vertical thinking, you know, principles, truth, math, higher being, absolutes, which is laughingly called philosophy in the human race. I say laughingly because it never goes anywhere, except in circles. It's like a dog chasing his tail, philosophy. But, you know, it's better than you all sit down to dinner and you talk about green beans. Pass the green beans, pass the salt. Did you have a nice day today, dear? Oh, yes, at the plant we got two new machines. Oh, that's nice, dear. And Johnny did his homework today. That's so mind-numbingly dull. That, you know what, thinking about Descartes saying coquito, ergo sum. Big typo there. I should, should have said cogita. Well, that's that's nine times better than pass the green beans. So a whole lot of people who have achieved something in this life, they get off on poetry and art and philosophy and blah de blah because it sure is better than passing the green beans. And they, they, it never really dawns on them that hi their vaunted verticalities really aren't vertical at all. It's just more hallucination. In different words than green beans. They don't have any understanding of truth. I mean, I really do not understand for the life of me how anybody who's a scientist or a mathematician doesn't automatically believe in God. Math is the, act, the closest thing to seeing scripture outside of the Bible is math itself. Everything about it displays the character of God. Math is like the numerical equivalent of the Bible. Everything, it's every doctrine in the Bible, there's some kind of math rule or principle or a set of equations that reflects it totally astonishing to me. So then how come you look at the face of God when you see math? So how come they don't know? 
because they're not thinking vertically. That's why they're not thinking about what's above. They're looking at some way to escape green beans. So it's integrated hypocrisy. It's integrated incompetence. It's integrated kind of like in curiosity. A lack of curiosity about the whole God question because the whole God question is relegated to the crazy. There no, there's no actual investigation of the God question. You either like the idea or you don't, and if you don't, you grab any excuse you can to justify your dislike. Well, then that's not investigation of truth. There's no such thing as objectivity. There's no real quest for truth. It's I like, I don't like. And I'm not pretending that I'm different. What's different is that there is such a thing as objective truth. There is such a general and genuine existence question of, is there a God? If so, who? If so, who? And if yes, then how does this God communicate? How are you going to know if you don't ask? And how are you going to ask if you're not interested? But if you are interested and you do ask, well, how do you know when you're getting the answer? Well, there's only one possible logical way to reply to that. If there's really a God and he knows you want to know him, he'll make sure you understand. And the proof that you get is going to be personalized to you. Because how else are you going to know it conclusively? It has to be personalized. It can't be generalized. If it's generalized, you might be able to explain it away as something else. But if it's personalized, nobody's going to believe you. But you'll know. I know. I've known God my whole life. Can I prove it to you? No. I can show you Bible. Bible's absolute proof of God. And so is scripture. But hello, if you don't know how to look at it, then you don't know the proof is there. You know, you stick a blind man in a house he's never been in. And all the things that are in that house are things he's never touched. I mean, you know, items that, that, that don't bear any kind of similarity to anything he's ever touched in his lifetime of being blind. So he has no frame of reference. Well, then you're telling him what those things are. He's got to just flat believe you. And why should he believe you? Until he himself becomes sighted. Okay, well, who gives you the sight? It has to be God. And then I can look at the same data you look at. I see him and you don't. Does that make me better than you? No. You're probably better than me. It's not about being better. It's about being curious. And that's the final statement in all this. It, the integrated hypocrisy and incompetence and inability and in curiosity and leads to, you know, depression, ennui. What did I get for all the hard work I did down here on this earth? No, well, you got the world. You won it. You got the world for all your hard work. Trouble is, it's not a very good prize. And what do I get for wanting to know God? Well, a whole lot of things that people won't appreciate, and I don't either. But once I know him, I don't care. I can have everything, I can have nothing. They're two distinct worlds. This is what I didn't understand until lately. They're two distinct worlds. The world that humans live in, there is it's got it's like it's it's like that, that dialogue we're reverting back to philosophy now. In Plato's Republic, Plato was taught supposedly, okay. Um, Plato's a writer. Socrates was talking to a guy that he na named Glaucon. Glaucon means blind. And what he was saying is that, uh, I want to say it's in the treatise on the cave, 
is that mankind is living in a cave. You know, the earliest version of the modern movie, Matrix. That mankind is living in a cave and the idea is to get enlightenment from the gods. And that's why philosophers ought to be kings. blah de blah de blah And what was so astonishing about this is that what in the mouth of Plato or mouth of Socrates, Plato was writing about this. That how true it really is, and we all even know it's true. I mean, Plato's Republic has been out for a long time. It's been required reading in high schools forever. We even know that's true. We know we're living in a cave, but we don't want to get out of it. That's what Glaucon was represented. That's why it's called Glaucon. Well, I like it here in the cave. It's warm, it's familiar. Drippy, maybe. Dark. But it's, I like it. I know this. I'm, it's familiar to me. Don't enlighten me. And of course, that's the whole point of that section of the Republic. Well... People like being blind. They like being small. They like being parochial. Beyond that, well, yeah, there's God. And yeah, you can see him, but they don't want him. And when they try, it's unfamiliar, and they got to goof it up with all kinds of really weird human ideas, like all of our stupid God movies that don't have anything to do with God. And all of our religious stand-up, sit-down, stand-up, sit-down contra beads. Be sure to only use your left hand. As if God is supposed to, you know, regard that and even make it a rule. What kind of God would make a rule like that? We don't ask those questions. We don't ask questions. We think we're not supposed to ask questions. We tell each other, Oh, if you ask questions, that means you doubt God. Yeah. And it could also mean that you want to know Him better. What was... Of course you doubt. Why shouldn't you doubt? I doubt all the time. Why not? Because the minute you stop doubting, honey, it's the minute you stop thinking. But, oh, you know, then you're not a good Christian if you doubt. You know, cause they don't understand what James was talking about when he warned about doubting. God makes a promise that he will take care of you. God makes a promise that if you ask a question, he'll answer. So don't doubt that you're going to get one. That's what James is saying. But see, they, they have to spin it. They have to twist it. Everything in the Bible has to be twisted. Because we really can't understand it. And we don't ask God to cause us to understand it. So at root, this whole business about integrated hypocrisy is that we want to be horizontal. And because we want to be horizontal, we are. We're trained that way from birth. We get to like it. We stay that way. And then all of our concepts about everything that has to do with truth or principle or, you know, math even, philosophy, yada yada, well, it's all it's all garbled with horizontal ideas. So it never reaches any kind of level of real principle or real truth or real understanding. It stays all rooted in the parochial with fancy words. Big words. I know a lot of big words. whoop dee do. Oh, you're smart, brain out. No. And if I am, so what? That and 25 cents might buy you part of a cup of coffee. Happiness is knowing God. But to know God, you got to ask. To, to ask, you got to be curious. And we're not curious. That's the fundamental of it. We like the horizontal. We like living like animals. 
We want to depend on some friend of ours telling us something about God more than we want to depend upon what God says about God in his own book. The actual source text of the Bible itself is granted less respect and less credence and certainly less attention than some human being with a mouthful of teeth who you just like the way he talks or you feel you want to be his friend and so he's your teacher or your friend or your I don't know what person you listen to and the Bible just sits there gathering dust so okay that was your free use of your free will that's how you hardwired your soul that's the soul you die with so now the kings are those who, like little Lord Fauntleroy, were thinking in terms of principle. And yeah, it was focused on persons, dearest, the mother. But it was, you know, I mean, it, it kind of illustrates both sides of the story. I mean, poor little little Lord Fauntleroy, all he could think of, of was people and being nice to people. And that's all moral and good. He didn't talk about God or think about God at all, though they stood there in church and all oh, they sang hymns. And while they were singing hymns, he interrupted and stopped singing his hymn about Christ dying on the cross. And talked to his grandfather about his dead relatives who were buried in the church they were singing in. So Christ didn't mean anything. That's hypocrisy for you, right there in that scene, toward the end of the movie, Little Lord Fauntleroy, when they're singing in church. They're all there, expected to be there, and they're singing. There's no teaching going on. They're singing. And the doctrine in the song is really important. Christ died on the cross for your sins. But he's not thinking about what he's singing. He's looking at the walls of the church where some spelling is from some dead relatives who he's now newly part of and asks his grandfather a question. Very politely, of course, may I interrupt while we're singing. He's not thinking of the words. That's the soul he dies with. That's the soul the human race dies with. And the real little Lord Fauntleroy's had to learn to think toward God instead, which means that they sort of depart from all this sideways thinking. And they're very, therefore, not. They don't fit in this world. They might be rich. They might be poor. They might be well-known. They might be not known at all. They might be hidden. They might be, you know, out in front and public. But they don't fit in. They hide it. They don't hide it. Whatever. Sooner or later, you're going to get exposed. But they don't fit in. They're not comfortable, and they don't fit in. Because once you start thinking vertically toward God, all the rest of this stuff, it's like, oh man, that's a waste of time. And you have to, you know, be polite. Well, this is their world. This is what they like. These are the humans. This is the things that are important to them. Use good manners, which is, after all, a form of hypocrisy. So you have to be hypocritical to the hypocrites. And it's called respect. Respect for their culture and their norms and beliefs. Yeah. And then you can't wait until the time you start looking at your watch, surreptitiously, of course. When can I get out of here so I can go be alone on the mountain? How many times did Christ walk away from crowds? Being alone with God. Because the more you spend time out here with people, the harder it is to bear. 
Okay, so then you're learning to become the king. And the part I hate about this the most is that means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, like little Lord Vatlor, you're going to be the one in control of the territory. And everybody will be talking about everything you do and say that day. That's their entertainment. That's their verticality. Because that's what they chose down there. So they're horizontal down here. And they remain horizontal. Happy. No longer sinning. Knowing the truth. And processing it horizontally. Just like they do down here. Here they misprocess it. Here they screw it up. Here they violate even what they believe in. There they won't. But the narrow bandwidth of understanding horizontally remains. And if you're a king of a kingdom, every single day, all the newspapers and everything, everywhere you turn is all going to be about you. Because see, they didn't look at Christ, so now they get to look at you and you're his representative. It's called parenting. Sounds an awful lot like hell to me. Why God loves us 